So, so I feel like my talk is probably going to be the least rigorous of all the talks you're going to hear about today because it's, it's not scientific at all and, and I'm not going to deal with the history of vaccines. This is almost entirely going to be um, a relation of sort of my anecdotal experience dealing or, and speaking with parents who are hesitant to vaccinate their kids. I, as a pediatric infectious disease specialist, tend to get a lot of these referrals because sometimes um, if parents have spent a lot of time uh, searching information on the internet, frontline providers uh, occasionally don't feel well equipped to answer an onslaught of questions and so they get sent on to me given that I spend most of my day thinking or talking about uh, infectious diseases. So as a jumping off point, I thought we'd start with sort of where we are, as in Canadians, with respect to what we think about vaccines. This was an Angus Reid poll that came out uh, in February of this year. You can look up this on the internet if, should you like. And what it found was that 88% of respondents believe that vaccines prevent uh, disease in individuals. To me, this is sort of good and, and sort of bad because 88% is almost 100, so that's sort of good. But that, that means that one in nine people apparently don't believe that vaccines prevent infections. And so for, for really one in nine, to, to persist in that belief either demands a complete rejection of medical science or a unwillingness to sort of continue uh, in sort of a rational conversation about this topic, and that is certainly those people's right, but you sort of know where you are with those one in nine. Now, almost the same amount believe that vaccines also worked in the community, but this next bit was the, was the good bit for me. So apparently, 39% of respondents in this national survey believe that the science on vaccinations wasn't quite clear. And so at first glance, you think, ah, what, no biggie, you know, I mean, maybe, I think it's entirely possible that 49% of the audience doesn't think the science on vaccinations is quite clear. But imagine, but imagine if, if you saw something that said 39% of Canadians thought that, well, you know, there might be something between smoking and lung cancer, we're not sure, it could be more studies, like that would be crazy. Or, you know, maybe exercise makes you healthier, but mm, tough to say, like... <laughs> Like, this is the level, like, just so that we're putting this in context, right? Like, there is, there is more evidence for the benefit of vaccinations than these other things. And yet it's not perceived to be that way. Almost a third of the people who took part in the survey worried about serious side effects in relation to vaccines. And so the question then becomes, okay, how does that happen? How is there this disconnect between what typical people think and the science that is out there. And, and in the whatever, wow, it's 2.12, in the like four minutes that I have left, I, I don't know if I can sort of in depth go into every facet of the psychology behind vaccines, but there are some things that come up again and again, some common patterns that I see when I, when I talk to parents in the office. And, and I thought I'd go through these. The first one, and I think the most important one, is this, right? And so I know all of you know Latin, but for those of you who don't, okay, this I think is the best example on the internet. And I, and I wish, this video is hilarious, okay? If I, if I had any confidence in my ability to post a video and have it actually work, then I would have done it, but I have never been able to make that work. So, so uh, what this guy's doing, you can see he's holding a lighter underneath a bag of microwave popcorn, and on the internet, if you listen, he goes, he goes, I don't uh, use microwaves. My son did once, and now he's gay. <laughs> so, and, and clearly, I mean, obviously, it's a joke. Everybody laughs. That's not true. Post hoc ergo propter hoc means that B follows A, so A must have caused B. And the, the example that I tend to use in the office is not like the hilarious YouTube video, but I say things like, you know, the days on, in the summer when the most ice cream is eaten are the same days in which the most frail elderly die. Right? And it's not because the ice cream is killing the old people, right? It's because those are the hottest days of the summer. Um, and so, so everybody gets this. Like I, I feel like this concept is, is widely accepted to be fallacious on people, but for some reason, okay, when it comes to vaccines, this belief is very powerful because I hear it all the time. And it's because the, the or I would posit that it's because of the emotional power of the argument, you have 
people who have either had friends or who have seen things on the internet where parents say truthfully, my kid had a vaccine, he got a fever the day after that, he was never the same, and then he was diagnosed with autism. Clearly, I believe that that happened. But, but it, it, it doesn't mean, obviously, that the vaccine caused the autism. And when you vaccinate every single child, you know, in a continent with, you know, 350 million people, sooner or later, you will vaccinate somebody who starts to have the signs of autism notice two days after the vaccine goes in. This is a big deal. Something that's slightly harder to explain is the phenomenon of compression. And by this, I mean that we are animals. People don't understand probability. Okay? People tend to overestimate the likelihood of rare events and underestimate the likelihood of common events. And, and the, the, the scenario in which this has been discussed the most is poker, right? So I feel like if I'm going to sit down and play poker for like a long time, for like three hours, I'm going to get a roll flush sometime in there. Like three hours is sort of a long time. It's a whole night. You know, it's a bunch of hands. But the odds of me getting a roll flush is 650,000 to one. Like that's crazy. Um, at the same time, if I'm playing poker and I get nothing or like one pair, five hands in a row, I get mad because I feel like, what are the odds on that? When the odds on that are very good because to get nothing or one pair is a common event. This has massive ramifications in the terms in, for vaccination, okay? Because people hear about very rare events and they stick in their mind. So it is true that influenza vaccination is associated with a one in a million risk of developing this bad neurologic syndrome, Guillain-Barre. It is true, okay? And so people think, wow, nobody can, can actually conceive one in a million. It's, it's sort of a small probability, but, but people remember this. And yet, very commonly, I would say a majority of the population thinks influenza is not a big deal, even though a lot of people tend to become debilitated and stay home from work for a few days, feeling miserable. And there are over 12,000 hospitalizations and 3,500 deaths in Canada per year because of influenza. It's like this is, is less than common, and, and, but people remember the risk. I mean, this is not the entire rationale for influenza vaccination because the rate of Guillain-Barre with actual influenza is way higher than vaccination. But, but this is a demonstration of how our inability to understand risk plays directly into the way people think about vaccinations. You know, so we're often not logical. We're not, we can't understand probability. And then you throw into the fact that uh, medical providers do not know how to communicate with people. This is not an indictment of any individual. It's just the way, okay, that the medical profession does business. And so in response to this widely reviled, uh, 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 completely debunked, uh, fallacious story about MMR causing autism, the Institute of Medicine in 2001 issued a statement to make people feel better. And this is what was in the statement. Okay, that the evidence favored rejection of a causal relationship between the population level between MMR vaccine and autistic spectrum disorder. This is not understood by people. I don't mean stupid people. I mean all people, because this is not the way that people talk. And yet, when, when, when medical people write stuff for other medical people, they do it in a way that medical people um, are, uh, are used to writing in. And this, this so this... If you take it, I mean, obviously they mean MMR doesn't cause autism, but this is not what's written. And so, and the message is diluted. Jargon is crazy. The other problem with medical communication is that one of the fundamental tenets of science is that you only say what you, what you actually can prove, and you can never prove that something doesn't happen. I cannot prove to you that I'm not like, you know, a cannibalistic alien from Mars. Like, it, it, it's just not possible. And so, in that statement, the... The, the Institute of Medicine also said this. They said, MMR doesn't cause autism, but mm, we can't exclude the possibility that maybe it does in a couple of people. And so the average person raised on, you know, Matlock, actually nobody here knows Matlock anymore. <laughs> the, the average person raised on, did this sounds like the IOM is talking out of both sides of its mouth. And so the message is much less powerful. How much time? Do I actually have two minutes left? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, great. So omission bias 
is also a big thing that's because, that I'm seeing more and more. Basically, omission bias refers to the fact that people think acts of commission are worse than acts of omission. Uh, this is the classic example of omission bias. So imagine you're walking along and suddenly you see these five people tied to the trolley track. And the trolley is going down the track and it's going to kill them. Ah! And then you look down and it just so happens that you're beside a switch in the track. And if you flick that switch, then the trolley will, will go onto that other route and only kill that one dude. So the question is, what do you do? And the utilitarian answer is obvious, right? Like if you ask Mr. Spock, he flicks the switch. It's easy. Because for one person dies, but it is 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 less bad than five people dying. But the vast majority of people, and myself included, okay, feel weird about doing something that will result in somebody dying. And so I, if you ask me this, I would probably freeze, not do anything, because I don't want to kill this guy. Even though, like, I mean, I didn't tie anybody down, I didn't start the trolley. Like, I, I'm not, I'll clearly not responsible for the dude's death, but I feel like I would be. And the exact same thing happens with vaccines. Okay, so parents, Normal people hear from physicians, vaccines are important, they prevent disease, you should do this. And then they also hear from other friends and from the internet, watch out, because all of this bad stuff can happen. And so what do parents do? They do nothing. They freeze. And they say, well, let's just wait. Because that is way easier than having to make a decision. The problem with waiting okay, is that both at an individual and at a societal level, this is very bad because suddenly you have many more unvaccinated and therefore unprotected young infants who are then going to get infections that they otherwise would not have gotten. And there's no payoff in terms of like less autism because it doesn't cause autism anyway. So delaying vaccination, even though it seems to be the least of all evils, okay, is actually a problem. So in summary, I would say that most of the people that I see in my clinic are not cuckoo. They are normal people, okay, who actually care about their kids and want to make the right decision. Uh, the problem is, is that the things that make, a uh, make us human interfere with our ability to make rational decisions. Okay, this, this is true for vaccines. This is also true for lots of other things. Like, this is not exclusive vaccines. Um, and so what I think is that it is important, uh, is incumbent upon us uh, as the sort of medical greater community to work with these parents and try to see what it is we can do to get them to a yes about vaccinations. And that's what I got.